Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tampa. My name is Ed Benedict. I'm your worship associate today. I've been at UU for 53 years now, and 24 have been spent in this congregation as a member. Uh, if you haven't done so, please silence your cell phones and devices. This simple hack act will help us enjoy this service more today. It's a pleasure to welcome you today on the second Sunday in May, the 8th, which happens to be Mother's Day. As you know, in recent years, some have said that the American Mother's Day has become too commercialized, which may be true. But when you look at why the holiday's founder, Anna Jarvis, in 1908 suggested that we should have such a day as Mother's Day, it was to honor the person who has done more for you than anyone in the world. Most likely, we all have somebody in our lives who fits that description. Happy Mother's Day to that person and what they have done for you. But you'll hear more about Mother's Day from our speaker today, who is the, our minister, the Reverend Dr. Jim McComer. Uh, he will talk about that in his sermon. If you're a first time, second time, third time, fourth time, or what time visitor to this church, welcome. We hope that you'll have experience something today that's going to bring you back again. Uh, you can learn more of us uh, from the back of your order of service. Right on the back there, we have our principles, we have our vision statement. And we've got a brand new covenant that we just voted on last Sunday, a very shortened version of it. You can check us, uh, check us out also on our website, which is uutampa.org. And we hope that you're going to hang around today after service for coffee and conversation, which follows this service. Just follow the crowd out to the gazebo uh, in the multi-purpose building, and you'll see the coffee hour, and you can find out more about our congregation there. I'm going to open our um, uh, service today with the stone ritual. I'm going to place three stones in our ritual bowl. The first stone represents the joy which may have occurred to you this past week. The second stone represents a sorrow that may have occurred this past week. This past week has been a particularly difficult week for this community because we have lost someone who was a longtime member uh, may he rest in peace. The third stone is to set the intentions for the coming week. For joy, sorrow, intentions for the coming week. And now, Reverend Jim McComer will give us words to light the chalice with. Good morning. Good morning. Our Mother's Day chalice lighting words come from Claudine Oliva. We light this chalice in tribute to the mothers in each of us. We light this chalice to celebrate those women and men who have taken on the task of raising a baby into childhood, to youth, and adulthood to celebrate those who have nourished the light of truth and compassion in growing minds and hearts, to celebrate those who have committed time, money, energy to the needs of the children of this world. We light this chalice to celebrate and hold dear this flame of love. And our opening words this morning come from Alice Walker. Love is not concerned with whom you pray or where you slept the night you ran away from home. Love is concerned that the beating of your heart should kill no one. Oh, 
Welcome to our Mother's Day service. I don't have to tell you that many layers of commercialism have wrapped themselves around this day of recognition, which actually began with a great noble intent. One of our own, Unitarian Julia Ward Howe, figured prominently in that intent. I want to devote some of my attention today to her, but I also want to devote some attention to the fact that those who have mothered us, nurtured us, are sometimes our mothers and sometimes they are someone else. Julia Ward Howe was on a par with pioneering feminists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. Ms. Howe is probably best known to us these days as the author, the composer of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Yet she was famous as a poet, essayist, and lecturer in her own lifetime, not unlike other transcendentalists, such as Emerson and James Freeman Clark, and a host of other males. As she matured, Howe began to assert her feminism. Consider this quotation, a recollection from her later years. During the first two-thirds of my life, I looked to the masculine idea of character as the only true one. I, thought, I sought its inspiration and referred my merits and demerits to its judicial verdict. The new domain is now made clear to me that of true womanhood. Woman no longer in her ancillary relation to her opposite man, but in her direct relationship to the divine plan and purpose as a free agent, fully sharing with man every human right and every human responsibility. Ends the quote. Hers was a seminal voice for feminism as it began its birthing process well over a century ago. Julia Ward Howe was born in New York City in 1819. Howe was her given name, of course. I'm sorry, yeah, Ward was her given name. She received a fine education through tutors and in private schools. She learned science, mathematics, and five foreign languages. Her father was an unreconstructed Calvinist with a core belief that God chose long ago who would be saved and who would not. When Julia was five years old, her mother died. Her single parent father, a successful banker, was very strict in a religious sense, even as the family, especially Julia, enjoyed great popularity in the most fashionable social circles. The persistent liberal ideas contained in the subjects she studied, especially literature, came into conflict with the religion of her upbringing. Late in life, she wrote, I studied my way out of all the mental agonies which Calvinism can engender and became a Unitarian. On a visit to Boston in 1841 at age 22, Julia Ward heard William Ellery Channing preach, visited the progressive New England School for the Blind with her new friend, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and met Samuel Gridley Howe, the pioneer educator of children with multiple handicaps. Howe and Ward were married two years later. 
They would have six children, although the sixth died in early childhood. Howe wanted a wife who would reside out of the limelight and support him in his work as a reformer. He did not get his wish. In 1848, two anthologies published several of Julia's poems, and a collection of her poems, Passion Flower, was published in 1854. Although published anonymously, its authorship soon became common knowledge, and husband Samuel became rather unhappy. Writing in 1863, Ms. Howe said this, I have been married 20 years today. In the course of that time, I have never known my husband to approve of any act of mine which I myself valued. <laughs> they considered divorce, but they eventually decided to stay together for the sake of the children. Very gradually, they made adjustments to one another. A biographer notes that Samuel would confess his transgressions late in life, so there is little reason to suppose that Julia's activities were somehow entirely responsible for the marital friction between the Howes. When the Civil War broke out, both Howes worked with the U.S. Sanitary Commission, the relief agency founded by Unitarian minister Henry W. Bellows and, of course, the precursor to the Red Cross. Julia Ward Howe also began to receive frequent invitations to appear publicly. She became more and more involved in the social justice issue of her day, which was woman's suffrage. She presided over the New England Woman's Suffrage Association and the Massachusetts Suffrage Association for a total of 36 years, some of them simultaneously, these two agencies, all this between 1868 and her death in 1910. Inspired by the organizing efforts of an Appalachian woman named Anna Jarvis. Julia Ward Howe implored mothers all over the world to join in, declar in declaring June 2nd, 1870 as Mother's Day of Peace. The words of today's responsive reading are those of her Mother's Day proclamation. Ms. Howe organized her first rally and festival on Boston Common in that year. By 1873, her Mother's Day of Peace was celebrated in 18 cities. She presided over these early Mother's Days for years, but she never succeeded in getting her Mother's Day for Peace politically recognized. Although it was very popular in Boston for 10 years or so, until she stopped subsidizing it financially. It's probable that her participation in the woman's suffrage movement worked against her effort to gain recognition for the day. Four years after Julia Ward Howe's death, in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May, today, to be Mother's Day in response to a congressional resolution. It quickly became a fully secularized hallmark holiday. When a postage stamp was issued honoring Julia Ward Howe in 1988, there was no mention of Mother's Day at all on it. Honoring the parental figures in our lives 
has been important work for thousands of years. To be sure, honoring people who have martyred us and not to mention those who have fathered us is a duty of great importance. And yes, I do understand the words mother and father to be both nouns and verbs. Honoring mothers and fathers is a long-standing practice. The ancient Greeks held a spring festival in honor of mothers and offered tribute to Rhea, the mother of the Olympian gods. The English began Mothering Sunday as a tradition in the 17th century. And do I even need to mention the ancient Hebrew law set forth in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth. It's the fifth commandment in the Exodus version and it's the only one expressed in a positive voice. All the others are don'ts. We obviously recognize how secular and commercialized Mother's Day has become. According to our friends at Hallmark, about 96% of Americans participate economically in Mother's Day in some way. Of course, Many of us would prefer that Mother's Day still carried at least some of the meaning Julia Ward Howe attempted to bring to it, a united maternal stand for peace. This need, too, is centuries old. Julia Ward Howe's initial Mother's Day theme was filled with political activism peace issues, and the vote for women. The far narrower variation on that theme proclaimed by Woodrow Wilson was meant to honor women's place in the home, not their social activism. Another critical source of ambivalence, it seems to me, arises from the fact that not all of us have or had mothers who succeeded in fulfilling the nurturing roles our culture expects of them. Even with all the long overdue progress of feminism in the past century and a half, the nurturing role that has been culturally assigned to mothers has hardly vanished from their expected repertoires. We've seen fathers become far more willing to take up slack, at least to some degree. But mothering still largely falls to mothers. And some are better at it than others. After all, no two of us bring the same gifts to the table. We sometimes forget that, above all, mothers are human and hence subject to human failings, just as every one of us, not some of us, but every one of us, fail from time to time. Sometimes our relationships with our mothers become strained or broken, and we may become sad or even angry about those failed relationships whatever the actual reason for their failure. If that should happen, we often find others to help nurture us. We know that Julia Ward Howe was extremely active in the realm of social justice. She was good at nurturing organizations. But we really don't know what sort of a mother she was. Hers was a conflicted marriage and presumably a conflicted family, family life. She had five children who apparently made it into adulthood, but I have no idea what became of them. There is no readily available record of them 
at least in the popular literature. History has kind of swallowed them up. Did she nurture her children? Or was she too busy with those other things? Of course, those other things were of great importance in her time and now. Yet we don't know if her own children would have honored her as their mother, fixed her breakfast in bed, followed up by actually cleaning up the kitchen. Don't know. Would they have honored someone else? We have no way to know. We do know that her husband would almost certainly not so honor her. Her independence and feminism clearly alienated him. I dare say everyone here today got some mothering, some nurturing along the way as each of us grew up. For many of us, the nurturance we needed came from our mothers, and for many others, it came from someone else. If you had not been nurtured, I don't think you would be here. You see, it takes a sense of being connected for someone, for anyone, to feel they are a valid part of a liberal religious community. This in turn seems to me to be contingent on our faith traditions, heavily weighted emphasis on the discernment of what it means to be human and to enjoy human connection. Had you received no human nurturing along the way, I don't think you would feel the least bit comfortable here. It's not a question of whether we have received nurturing. The only issue is who discerned our needs and fulfilled them as they could. Perhaps we would have benefited from more than what we got. But I don't think any of us has been entirely deprived. If we had mothers who nurtured us, with whom we've had loving, positive relationships, then let us endeavor to follow their model, not only with our own children, but with others we relate to in any of a variety of different ways. If someone else mothered us, nurtured us, let us thank them too. Whether they be fathers, brothers or sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, a teacher, a particularly kind neighbor, or your best friend. Somewhere, somewhere we will find a model worthy of emulation someone who cares about nurturing, someone who cares that we stop allowing our children to be taken from us in order to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. And there we shall find someone to honor today on Mother's Day. So might that be. And I'm in.